This is the Chem 1 lecture over periodic trends. And this is supposed to be a recap of periodic trends. You are expected to read through the Pogel. So periodic law is just simply the fact that you're going to see a lot of patterns on the periodic table. And our goal is to not only know the patterns, like Adam's size gets bigger as you go down and smaller as you go across, but also to understand the why. The two main things that explain your trends are effective nuclear charge and electron shielding. Effective nuclear charge will explain all the trends as you go across the periodic table. Electron shielding will explain all the trends as you go down a periodic table. So let's focus on effective nuclear charge first. Effective nuclear charge is the fact that the protons in the nucleus have a positive pull that the outer electrons feel. And so as you go across an energy level, the energy level is not changing. But as you go across, the number of protons is changing. There's more and more positives in the nucleus, and more positive, that's a stronger pull, and so it's going to attract those electrons more tightly. And so that's why you see the size of an atom decreases as you go across the periodic table, because the pull from the nucleus is increasing as they're an addition of protons. This will also explain ionization energy, that it's much harder to remove an electron from an element on the right side of the periodic table because there's a tighter grip on those outer electrons from the pole of the nucleus. And then let's focus on when you go down a family or a group, you have electron shielding at play. And that's just the fact that inner electrons are blocking that nucleus pole on those outer electrons. I kind of see it as a shield. So like on energy level one, the nucleus has easy access to the electrons. But when you go down to energy level two, now the, the electrons on the outer energy level of two are a little bit shielded from the pole of that nucleus. And so you see a pattern as you go down the periodic table that the outer electrons experience a lesser pull from the nucleus because they're shielded by the closer electrons or those inner electrons. And so this is why atoms are, they increase in size as you go down a group and you can just visually see that. It's easier to remove electrons that are at the bottom of the periodic table because those outer electrons don't have much of a pull from that nucleus. It's way harder to remove an inner electron than it is an outer electron. So knowing effective nuclear charge and electron shield should help you be able to explain the why for all the trends that we're going to talk about. The first two trends we're going to talk about are radius, either as an atom or as an ion, but they both have to do with the size of the atom. So the general trend on our periodic table is that we see an increase in size as you move towards francium. And so we talked about that the electron shielding increases as you go down, therefore the size of the atom is able to expand. And then we're on the left side of the periodic table, and we know that the effect of nuclear charge is weaker on that side. So francium is a great go-to element for size. So that's our biggest element on the periodic table. Sometimes we call francium Big Frank, because he is our largest element on that periodic table. So let's practice below. It says we're going to circle the one with the larger radius. So you always want to have a periodic table nearby, and we're going to compare fluorine versus bromine. Those are two halogens, fluorine and bromine. And we would say bromine is the larger atom. It's farther down the periodic table. It literally just has more energy levels, so the size of the radius is larger. Let's look at manganese and arsenic. Manganese is right there. Arsenic, so they're on the same energy level. And so... Easy way is manganese is obviously closer to the left side, but the correct explanation is that manganese has less protons. I think it has 25 protons, and arsenic has 33, and so arsenic has a much higher effective nuclear charge. There's more protons pulling tightly on those outer electrons, making the atom smaller. And then 
Let's jump into ionic radius. It's a similar trend in terms of size, but ion is when you have a charged particle. And so when you have something like this example, potassium ion, calcium ion, chlorine ion, I think they're all isoelectronic. Like I think they all have 18 electrons. Calcium's lost two, chlorine's gained one. They all have 18, so we can't look at electrons. So then once again, we look at that proton pole. So potassium has 19 protons, calcium has 20, chlorine has 17. So in terms of the larger radius, that's going to end up being chlorine because it has the least amount of pole from that nucleus. Calcium has 20 protons pulling on those 18 electrons. That's going to be a much smaller atom. Um, here we have sulfur and chlorine, also isoelectronic. So they both have, it appears, 18 electrons. And so then we look at protons. Sulfur has 16 protons. Chlorine has 17. And so if we're looking for the largest ion, that's going to be sulfur because it has the least pole on its electrons. Another way to look at it is that it gained two electrons. So it's probably going to be the larger atom when you gain something. So our next trend is ionization energy, and that's the energy required to remove an electron from an atom. So the general trend is we see an increase in energy as you head towards helium. Helium's going to be the go-to. And the reason why is that helium is a noble gas, so they're already stable. They don't want to lose any electron. Helium's really, really small. So that nucleus, that effective nuclear charge, is going to have a tight pull on its two electrons. So you think about the electrons are going to be really close to the nucleus, so it's going to be hard to try to pull one of those electrons away. So we see that there's an increase in effective nuclear charge, as well as a decrease in shielding. That nucleus isn't shielded, so it has a strong pull on that electron. Therefore, it's going to take a lot of energy to remove one of helium's electrons. And that's going to be true for all those noble gases. They already have their eight valence electrons, and so they are going to hold tightly on to those electrons. So let's see, let's do some practice. We have oxygen and sulfur, and we're circling the one that will have the larger ionization energy. Right? It requires more energy. So we have oxygen, and we have, looks like sulfur is kind of right underneath it. So Easy way, oxygen is closer to helium. Using our understanding, oxygen is going to require more energy because it's smaller in size. So there's a greater pull from the nucleus on oxygen's electron, so it's going to be harder to try to take one away. So oxygen has, um, I guess they're similar in effective nuclear charge, but then it's the shielding effect that it's a smaller atom. Let's look at potassium and bromine. So we find potassium's an alkaline metal, and bromine is a halogen. Getting hard to see over there. So they're on the same energy level. So which one is going to require more energy to remove an electron? Well, if we know that our trend is to the right, requires more energy, then that's going to be bromine. The why is because there's an increase in the effective nuclear charge. So they're both on energy level four, but the difference between potassium and bromine is there's way more protons as you go across. So that pull from the nucleus has strengthened as you go across. Something else to note is we typically are talking about the energy required to take the first electron, that outer electron. But what happens if you then, you take the first one and you want to take another one? It's going to become increasingly harder, more and more energy to take more and more electrons because now that nucleus is growing stronger in its pole because there's less negatives to focus on. Our second to last trend is electronegativity, which is the tendency to attract electrons in a bond. Typically draw a heart around electrons when I can. These are the atoms that really want to attract an electron. And so the general trend is that electronegativity increases as you move towards fluorine. 
So fluorine is your go-to, your most electronegative. And if we think about it, it kind of makes sense. Fluorine's a halogen, group 17. They have seven valences. They only need one more electron to become stable. So they are going to be reactive to get that one more electron. So as you trend up and to the right, your electronegativity is going to increase. So circle the one with the larger value, nitrogen or arsenic. So we find nitrogen, we find arsenic, so they're in the same family, and nitrogen's going to end up having a greater electronegativity. Easy ways, it's close to fluorine, but using our, our effective nuclear charge and shielding effect, nitrogen is not as shielded as arsenic. Arsenic's on the fourth energy level, and so how do you attract an electron? You need a positive charge. Well, arsenic's positive charge is buried under four energy levels, so it's going to be harder to attract that electron versus nitrogen's only on two energy levels. The nucleus is not as shielded. Let's look at sodium and phosphorus. We have Na, alkali metal. Phosphorus, I think it's blacked out. I think it's right after silicon. So we are both on the same energy level, so shielding effect is not in play. What is in play, the trend that explains as we go across, is the effective nuclear charge. There is an increase as you go across, so that proton pole is stronger for phosphorus than it is sodium, so it's going to be easier to attract an electron when that positive pole is stronger. And we know that pole increases as you gain more protons on the same energy level. And finally, our last trend is chemical reactivity. Try to use a color I haven't used. That is yellow. Yay. Okay, so chemical reactivity is a trend of the reactivity on a periodic table. And this one looks different than all the other ones because it's a split trend. There's a reactivity for metals as well as non-metals. So recap, we know the whole left side are considered metals with the exception of hydrogen. And we know the whole right side is non-metals. And so things you have to remember are going to be Reactivity for metals increases as you head towards francium. We've seen francium as the go-to for atomic radius. This is also the go-to for most reactive metal. And then also starting with an F, the most reactive non-metal is fluorine. And so francium is the most reactive metal because it's so shielded being on the seventh energy level that that outer electron can be easily taken and gone into a reaction. And then we've kind of already talked about fluorine. It's so reactive because it has seven valences. Electrons wants one more. So it's going to be really reactive. It's small so that nucleus isn't shielded so it can attract an electron pretty easily. So I'm going to erase all this scribble and let's just practice a few. And so ideally, we should always just compare two metals and see which one's reactive or two non-metals. We shouldn't be giving you a metal and a non-metal because that would be blending trends. Okay, so let's compare barium and beryllium and see which one is more reactive. So we got barium, alkaline earth, and beryllium. Who's going to be more reactive? So if you remember Big Frank, it's going to be barium. But remember the Y is having to do with an increase in the shielding effect. Barium's nucleus is buried by those inner electrons, so its outer electron is way easier to go into a chemical reaction than beryllium, who's just on that second energy level. Um, phosphorus and chlorine. Phosphorus and chlorine, same energy level, both nonmetals, and we know the most reactive is fluorine. And so chlorine is clearly closer to fluorine, but let's kind of understand the why. So effective nuclear charge explains everything going across horizontally. And so if we compare phosphorus and chlorine, it's a difference of protons. There's 17 positives versus 15 positives. The 17 positives has a greater pull, and that's going to be helpful when you're trying to attract something negative which would make you reactive.